Hello, my name is Maria Jalakar. Welcome to my show, Let's Talk About History. Today my guest is Faye Ringle. She's authored a book, The Gothic Literature and History of New England, Secrets of the Restless Dead. Thank you for joining me today, Faye. Thank you, um, Maria. How did this book come to be written? Well, it's kind of a long story. Um, I've spoken on your show before about such things as witches and vampires and other stories that uh, feature in this book. And I had written a book um, in the 1990s with a very similar title covering some of the same areas and some different areas as well. And I thought that maybe that was all I had to say um, on the subject, but during the pandemic, I was approached by a, a publisher from the United Kingdom called Anthem Press, asking me if I would write a shorter, very condensed book that could be used by students who wanted to learn more about Gothic literature and history, and also by the general public who might be interested in reading it. And I was given a very tight, strict word limit and a strict time frame. And it was, uh, uh, I did it. I wrote it the entire thing during the pandemic, basically without leaving my house. What do you mean by New England Gothic literature? Okay. All, well, New England is the easy part. Um, I've covered all the New England states, although um, as a Norwich lifelong resident, I did tend to favor Connecticut and Rhode Island a, a little bit more than, than the other states. But yeah, I've got things from all the New England states. But the Gothic literature part, now that's harder to define. Um, Gothic literature is usually, usually refers to, some people might call it horror or the supernatural, but it also refers to um, a kind of twisted view of life, a kind of uh, a way of looking at life through the opposite of rose-colored glasses. Everything is dark. Everything is secret. Everything is declining and heading downhill fast. Um, and so in America, the Gothic literature in America usually refers not to the Middle Ages, which was the original uh, source of the word Gothic. The Goths were the tribes that invaded Rome and brought down the Roman Empire. And the Middle Ages came to be referred to as Gothic at a time when people thought that that was bad. It started out as a bad thing, but it very quickly became a romantic thing, a romantic way of looking at the past and uh, writing about the superstitions and beliefs and the hauntings of the past. And I'll speak a little more later about how that worked out in New England. About the, about the week, uh, the haunting of the past? Uh, yes. I didn't quite get the, that. Ah that um, in Gothic literature, it's all about the past never staying dead, coming back as ghosts, as vampires, as witches, but also as guilty secrets, things that people would prefer not to talk about. So the great Gothic literature might be something like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, where a scientist dares to tamper with nature and create this unholy animated corpse, essentially, that, uh, that takes on a life of its own and goes all of destroying the countryside. Gothic literature can also refer to, as I do in the book, um, the works of Nathaniel Hawthorne. In the Scarlet Letter, there's guilty secrets that, that just keep tormenting the living. And uh, even though there are no ghosts in The Scarlet Letter, it is a very gothic novel. Mm. Okay. Um, mm. it sounds as though the English were very gothic at one time, weren't they? Well, 
what we now call the great Gothic revival of the 18th, late 18th century did begin in both England and Germany. But of course, oh. we tend to read the English works because we read English. Oh, and okay. it was the 18th century in Europe was known as the age of reason or the age of the enlightenment. But at the oh. same time, the very same time that you have the scientific revolution and people beginning to move away from a religious worldview and towards a scientific worldview, you had a reaction against that where intellectuals and ordinary people said, hey, you know, this is not much fun. I'd rather read about dungeons, ghosts, the Inquisition, uh, people having very strange incestuous relations with uh you know. So far from the Norman society where you get married and have a couple children and hopefully everything will turn out right in the end, the happy ending, it's far from that type of um, social economic scale, I guess you would put it. Yes, that's very well put, Maria. Because Thank you. Very well put. I do same. have a question. I do have a question. Um, sure. where does Gothic architecture come from? That's a good, that, that's also, it's connected. Remember I said that in the, in the 18th century, the age of reason, um, the, the prevailing, um, kind of architecture was very plain and square. Just think about all of the great brick houses in we have around here and, and all the way down towards Williamsburg in Virginia. All those beautiful Georgian brick houses that are extremely really? square and classical and, and brick. Yeah. Or else uh, yeah. think of the typical um, white congregational church that is very square and unornamented and uh, you know, it's, it doesn't look like what we now call a Gothic cathedral. That's because in the 18th century, with the ideal being classical and simple and plain and square, they actually thought that, that the great cathedrals like Notre Dame or uh, Canterbury Cathedral in England were barbaric. They were Gothic. And so they, oh. they named that architecture after the Goths who destroyed the Roman Empire. But very quickly, that sense of an insult disappeared. And instead, people came to, to believe that Gothic architecture was beautiful, was something to be imitated and revived. And that mm -hmm. led to a kind of architecture we have a lot of around here called Gothic Revival. St. Patrick's Cathedral in Norwich is Gothic yes. revival architecture, but so is, um, they, they, there are a lot of what's called carpenter Gothic, that is um, in wood. If you go along mm -hmm. Washington Street, um, right across from, um, from what's now the Mohegan Memorial, there's a beautiful Gothic revival, carpenter Gothic house that looks like uh, a, a Gothic cathedral, only it's in wood. Okay. All righty. All right. So are you saying that maybe there are people in society who are involved in this type of thing and don't really, well, it sounded like you were talking. All right. Um, many people think of goth as those white based kids about, is there any connection? Well, there is. Um, in America and in England, there, there has been really for 40, 50 years now uh, a goth subculture of music, of black clothing, uh, of uh, attempting to look almost like a ghost by wearing very white makeup and black lipstick, uh, piercings. A lot of the things that were part of the goth subculture are now much more common, tattooing and piercing and such. But the goth subculture uh, took their name from this gothic way of looking at the world, of this, uh, this uh, a lot of uh, both, uh, you'd say, a negative way of looking at the world. And uh, 
also an idea that, you know, maybe the world was going to end pretty soon. So what was the point in uh, trying with to have war, it? With the war going on between Russia and Ukraine, a lot of people are thinking it's World War Three out there. I hope not. Let's pray there's uh, peace in that area. Who are some of the authors you write about? Well, I wrote about a lot of authors. I packed as many authors as I could into 100 pages and uh -huh. uh, really just couldn't say a whole lot about any of them in order to, to fit lots in. But among the more famous I've, uh, authors I wrote about were um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, the author of The Scarlet Letter and uh, The House of the Seven Gables, and um, I do mention Edgar Allan Poe, even though he's not from New England, uh, because he is the prime, most famous example of the American Gothic. But in New England, uh, there are, uh, well, there are poets like Lydia Sigourney, who lived right here in Norwich, who is not generally thought of as Gothic, but who wrote a number of poems dedicated to dead babies, and also wrote a lot of, of several poems, at least, about yeah. ghosts and other local legends. Uh, that's our own Lydia Sigourney that I, uh, I think I've spoken about in the past. Um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, another writer who lived it was a much It was a much more difficult time then. You know, we didn't have the medicine that we had today, and sometimes... You know, with childhood vaccines, vaccinations, sometimes, you know, um, they yes. gave birth and they didn't make it through childhood. It's very sad, but that was a very difficult time. Yes. I mean, absolutely. it just goes to show what she was writing about had to do with what was going on in, in society at the time. Right? It's true. Yes, she lived a good long life, and uh, many, many of her friends and her relatives, she had no children of her own, but uh -huh. she lost many nieces and nephews and the children of friends. Yes, yes. And uh, that was in the first half of the 19th century. Um, okay. Lots of so lots of other writers of the 19th century. In the 20th century and the 21st, people, of course, will recognize Stephen King. Uh, Maine's most famous writer of the New England Gothic, um, somewhat less famous, but who also still lives in New England, is um, Joe Citro, who wrote, has written a number of scary books set in Vermont. Um, there's a writer who named the one, Who is the one from, did the Corning or something? Do you, is that, who is that? That wasn't, he was a famous Not sure, writer. But, what was the book title you gave? Who wrote the what? Corny? The Corny? The, I don't know, something about a cornfield or something. I'm not sure what oh, exactly. You're thinking, you're thinking Stephen King's oh. Children of the Corn. Oh, okay. Is, who, who, what, what, what writer, author did you talk about? Did you I mention said, Stephen yeah. King? Stephen King. Oh, yeah, yes. he was. Yeah. Quite was is uh, a great yeah. living writer of New England Gothic. Um, yeah, well, he had books out in the 1980s, 1970s. He's been that's right writing yeah. books for quite some time. Yes, my father used to love those to read those his books. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he well, he was he was a um, a fan of Stephen King's books. Well, I've been a fan of Stephen King's books and Stephen <laughs> King since he began publishing. And I, I knew him. I met him in the in the 70s and I saw him uh, a number of times and interviewed him at pretty great length for my first book. I didn't uh, didn't this time around. But. OK. Um, this is a show that talks about history. How can history be gothic and what are some of the historical events you write about? Yes, and I, I, I'm so glad to be able to, in fact, talk about history. There's, there's an academic study called historiography, which is the study of how history is written. And there's an expression that history is written by the victors. That is, war history tends to be written by the people 
And the settlement of the United States was for many, many years written solely by the people who came from Europe and settled the United States and not by the native peoples who were here already. Only now are we starting to hear some native voices. Similarly, the history of black people in America was neglected and tended to be written only from the white point of view until you finally had black historians, the great black historians who started uh, Black History Month many years ago, for instance. Mm. Well, the what I refer to as Gothic history has to do with the point of view of that writing of history and the secrets that have that that um, shall we say the academic uh, and the people in power wanted to keep secret rather than uh, have you know have the point of view of those who have been oppressed show up. So, for example, uh, there then the other um, the Gothic history can also include when super what seem to be supernatural and unexplicable events. Uh, suddenly start happening and people resort to what we would call a superstitious way of explaining them. For example, the witch belief in the 17th century, which led to the great witch trials, not only in Salem, but right here in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And people were scapegoated and blamed for things that obviously they did not do and they were executed. Now, not everyone believed in witchcraft at that time. Even though it was the 17th century, there were people who really didn't believe in witches. But if the government enforced it, which is what happened in Connecticut and Massachusetts, then it didn't matter if you didn't believe in witches. Uh, those people were going to be tried and executed. In Connecticut, we had several trials where the, uh, the accused witches were convicted, but then the conviction was overturned by a particular governor who did not himself believe in witchcraft. So this kind of Gothic history for years, the, the towns in which it happened were embarrassed. They, they were ashamed. There's still in Connecticut is no monument to the victims of the witch belief. And in Salem, Massachusetts, the first monument put up by the city of Salem didn't happen until 1992, 300 years later. In between, it was one of those secrets that everyone knew about, but the official historians didn't like to talk about. So at the other, ex and of course, there were all kinds of conspiracy theories and beliefs that, uh, that, that, that these witches were in league with Satan to undermine the colony and so on. Well, sometimes we wonder if today that doesn't go on. I mean, I know that I've, sp I've spoken to people just, you know, briefly, um, someone that you might meet and they tell you that um, they, they, they um, you know, a study witchcraft and, um, well, yeah, and they're in a town and they're in a town. I won't mention any towns, but way out in the country, like, you know, well, I, I mean, they, like you said, I don't think they, it's not the norm in society, <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that I don't think that they, they talk about. I mean, many, some people have said, you know, that we don't know if they're people that are Satan worshipers. I, I really don't think I'd want to know, <laughs> you know, and what, what their beliefs are. Well, don't you agree? I I mean, it went on back then, but it can still can go on today. I can attest that if witchcraft were real and they had real powers, I would have been turned into a toad myself by now because I have interviewed yeah. many, many modern practitioners. And I, they are just like everybody else. It's an alternate path 
It's an alternate view of spirituality. And it's a set of beliefs, uh, no more dangerous than any other well, set when, of beliefs. When, when you think of a Satan worshiper, sometimes you think of the type of individual who would want to harm another individual. Like some uh, of the stories, you know, I well, don't know. I mean, you know, that's what we conjure up sometimes. And uh, I don't think... Conjure up is the right word, unfortunately. There indeed are dangerous Satan worshippers out there. Um, I must I haven't inter actually interviewed any, but remember that Norwich had a serial killer, Michael Ross, who was not a Satanist, who looked like everybody else and didn't do anything strange except kill young women. So wow. you know, you can't always tell the book by the cover so to speak. <laughs> Sometimes that makes you feel really thankful that you come this far, you know, without experiencing something that horrific. So um, how do Norwich and Eastern Connecticut play a part in this book? Well, the other aspect of my uh, Gothic literature and history is really what we might call folklore, legend, storytelling. Uh, what's the difference between history and legend? Well, we like to think that history can be supported by verifiable facts of births and deaths and marriages and genealogy and accounts, uh, narrative accounts by the first person. Whereas legends or stories are just that, stories that people told over the years that uh, just like the old game of telephone could definitely change as you went yeah. on from one person to the next. So Norwich has legends and so does Eastern Connecticut. Um, I've been doing tours for years around uh, Halloween uh, in the old burial, burying ground in Norwich town as part of the uh, uh, Walktober. And uh, there are all kinds of stories that are told about that old burial ground, including the story about Benedict Arnold not being able to rest easy in his grave, but coming back to visit the grave of his mother. There are stories told about people invading the cemetery and knocking over and destroying all the headstones that's that of the Arnold family, except for his mother. And there yeah. are stories, yeah. And there are other legends and stories of that, uh, of that place. There's stories- And do you, ha you have that in your book? Uh, you have some of the stories in your book? I do not the uh, not the whole thing, but I do have um, some of those stories, and I also um, talk about uh, the uh, the great story of Willamantic, the Wyndham Frog fight, yeah. and people who have traveled on Route 32 have crossed over what we call the Frog Bridge, that yeah. shows those two giant uh, four giant frogs sitting on on spools from the American thread thread mill. And that's an example of a true story that may have grown a little bit over the years, but started mm -hmm. out as a true story, that there was a great panic during the time of the French and Indian War in the 1750s. One night, um, the people of Wyndham, and this is uh, uh, the area around Wyndham Common, that uh, uh, it's off, not, not Willimantic, which is the borough, that suddenly they heard these unearthly noises and they thought they were being invaded by the French and Indians. And they turned out in their night clothes on the green and everyone was standing around and they called the militia out and everyone was, was standing to arms with their, with their rifles. And they kept hearing unearthly, terrible screeches and noises. And uh, over the years, the uh, the story grew, supposedly, that uh, they heard them, their names being called. They heard voices saying, Colonel Dyer, Colonel Dyer. <laughs> um, and in the morning, they looked out and there were a whole lot of dead bullfrogs. Oh. Uh, the story, now the explanation, we really don't know. <clears throat> One theory is that there had been a drought 
and their frog pond had dried up and all the bullfrogs had decided to migrate out of the pond and try to make it to another pond where there was their water, but there was no water and they died. Or possibly they were shot. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know. But he, without an internet, without anything else except a newspaper, a few newspapers and letters, the whole Connecticut colony came to know this story. And Wyndham, they made fun of Wyndham. They just said, look at these idiots. They got out their militia to fight frogs. <laughs> and the great Wyndham frog fight uh, passed into legend. But like the similar story of Yankee Doodle, the people of Wyndham decided to own their story. Instead of being embarrassed about it, they put a frog on the town seal and when the and in 2000, when they built that beautiful bridge, they said, "Let's put some giant frogs up there." Mm -hmm. So okay, all right. So uh, Faye, I'd like to thank you very much for joining me today. It was very interesting. Um, and your book. Good luck with your book. Um, Thank you. Uh, if anybody is, uh, is interested, uh, you can always get more information from me. I'm on Facebook and you know, I'm pretty findable. They, yeah. <laughs> my information seems to be all over the Internet. So yeah. <laughs> you're just welcome. Um, OK, thank you for joining me today, Faye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria.